So yes, the electricity is going through me, through my body, down to the ground, and then coming back to the apparatus, and I'm not killed. There's a great joy in teaching. Uh, it, it's one thing to know something. If there's nobody to share it with, it, it, it's not nearly as much fun. You walk into a classroom and you get immediate reward. The students let you know right away if you're doing a good job. It's instant feedback. Richard Muller's enthusiasm for spreading the lessons of physics beyond the science departments led the UC Berkeley professor and senior scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab to launch a course for the rest, all those non-science students who don't plan on making physics their full-time job. I think if you dislike physics, it's not your fault. I think we teach it badly. We're frequently teaching only to the students who are going to become future physicists. We don't do that with English. We don't do that with history. We, we, we teach everybody that. We need to do that with physics, too, and that's what I'm trying to do. And he seems to be succeeding. His Physics for Future Presidents course packs in 500 students every semester and was voted Berkeley's best class by readers of the student newspaper, The Daily Cal. Now your course is being webcast by the university throughout the world. That's been a wonderful experience. The university asked me if I'd be willing to webcast, and I said, what's that? You know, and they explained it to me, and I said, oh, that might be useful if one of my students misses a class. So I asked my class, I said, would you please email me if you're using the webcast? And I, I got an answer from Missouri. So the next lecture I said, anybody not in Berkeley, please email me. 87 countries so far, uh, including one from Timbuktu and from a high school student in Malaysia who was so grateful to the University of California for enabling him to get an education on things that he couldn't possibly do in his own country. Not satisfied with teaching physics to tomorrow's world leaders, Muller wrote a book directed to today's leaders. In it, he uses everyday language to explain the science driving the world's most pressing problems, global warming, terrorism, energy, nuclear weapons and power, and space exploration. I think there have been mistakes made in the past simply because People at the high level, not just the president, but, but congressmen and, and, and legislators, uh, have not had the background they need. The president, if he or she doesn't understand the physics, then they don't know how to balance the diplomacy, the economics, the science, all these things. My feeling is it's not good enough to have a good science advisor. The president, in this case, uh, our upcoming president, Barack Obama, needs to understand this stuff himself. Boy, with all the things on a president's plate, can we really expect them to learn the physics behind these problems? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> Just as we expect a president to know the difference between Shiite and Sunni, the president has to know the difference between a uranium bomb and a plutonium bomb. Uh, if the president doesn't understand this, it's hard to make decisions with what to do about North Korea, or what's going on in Iran. Something almost everybody gets confused about, that's global warming and the ozone hole. Muller spends a good portion of time in the classroom and in his book debunking many of the myths about issues like global warming. One, you have to recognize how bad it is. And, and the surprising answer is that so far it hasn't been very bad. We've had about one degree Fahrenheit of global warming so far, none whatsoever in the last 10 years. You need to know that because otherwise you will misunderstand when, when people criticize global warming, they say it's not real. The reason they're saying it's not real is there hasn't been any in 10 years. But we don't expect it to happen every year. It's a gradual thing that builds up. The problem is going to be the developing world, but if they can't afford to follow our example because it's expensive technology, then it's not going to address the problem. And I noticed in your book that one of the most important things that the president needs to consider in all of these issues have to do with the relative costs. Yeah, some people think physics doesn't involve costs, but any, any physicist knows that to do an experiment you have to bring the price down where it's affordable. The cost is central, uh, the, the cost of uh, space exploration. It, it costs one-tenth to do it with robots compared to humans. So there are some places where you might want to bring humans, but for the most part, if you could do 10 times as much with robots, you're much better off doing that. Does the president's success in any of these areas depend on his understanding of the physics behind them? I think so. Let's take an example of terrorism. The North Korean nuclear explosion uh, was about 400 tons of TNT equivalent. That sounds like a lot. But if you realize that the 
um, airplane, one airplane going into the World Trade Center carrying 60 tons of jet fuel. When that burned, it released the energy equivalent of 900 tons of TNT, 900. It's more than twice the energy of a North Korean nuclear, nuclear bomb. His ability to explain high physics in simple terms came in handy during his 34 years as a science advisor to the departments of Defense and Energy and NASA. But as down to earth as is his approach to talking science, Muller also keeps his head well above the clouds when it comes to his research in astrophysics. He studies cosmic microwaves and supernovas, among other things, work that has won him prestigious awards from the National Science Foundation and the MacArthur Foundation. He says it's the mix of research and teaching that motivates him. I think Berkeley has a unique match of wonderful students, a, a great deal of uh, freedom. Uh, I am encouraged to follow my crazy ideas and see where they lead. I can't imagine a more wonderful place to be uh, for someone who's interested in gaining new knowledge and in spreading that knowledge. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that with us. I'm Roxanne Makashchen in Berkeley. <laughs>